Hello, and thank you for attending today's webinar. We will begin the presentation in approximately one minute. Hello and welcome to how University of the Pacific uh, gains 65 days of productivity and restores instantly with rubric on AWS. My name is Girish Chanchlani. I'm a partner solutions architect at Amazon Web Services and I will be your host and moderator for today's presentation. So just a few housekeeping items as we get started. When you join today's webinar, you selected to join by either phone call or your computer audio. If for any reason you would like to change your audio selection, you can do so by accessing your audio pane in the control panel. From this control panel, you will also have the opportunity to submit questions to today's presenters by typing your questions into the questions panel. We will collect the questions and address as many as we can during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Also at the end of today's event is a brief survey. Please stay connected until the end of the broadcast and submit your feedback as your opinions count. Lastly, the PowerPoint presentation will be available through SlideShare, along with a recording of the webinar on YouTube. Uh, you will be notified via an email that will be sent two to three days after the conclusion of this event. So keep an eye out for the follow-up email sent to address that you have provided. Again, welcome to today's live webinar, how University of the Pacific gained 65 days of productivity and restores instantly with rubric on AWS. Uh, so today we will learn about uh, storage on AWS, uh, rubric cloud data management, and how uh, University of the Pacific centrally controls data and archives to the cloud. In addition to learning about AWS, we will also hear from Pierre uh, Frank Guglielmi, who's a technical manager, partner solutions at Rubric, and Tony Carrero, who's an enterprise systems manager at the University of the Pacific. And remember, please post your questions in the chat window throughout the presentation as we will review questions at the end of today's event. With that, let's start off by looking at what AWS offers today in the storage space. And our focus is going to be on what AWS storage services are available today and how they can help along with solutions from our partners to solve customers backup and recovery challenges. Quickly want to start off with how the AWS global infrastructure looks like. So Amazon cloud computing resources are located in multiple locations worldwide. These locations are composed of AWS regions and availability zones. Each AWS region is a separate geographic area, and each AWS region has multiple isolated locations known as availability zones or AZs. An easy way to think about an AZ is to think of a data center. Each availability zone is composed of one or more buildings, and these uh, availability zones within a region are separated from each other by a meaningful distance and protected against joint failures for maximum resiliency. At present, we have 22 regions spread out across the world and a total of 69 availability zones within those regions. In addition to this, we have announced three additional regions and nine availability zones that will be coming online in the first half of 2020. So when we look at storage solutions on AWS, we think of three main components. Core to this is the AWS services. These include storage services as well as other services like compute. AWS today offers more than 165 unique services and these offer customers scalability, durability, elasticity, and cloud economics to meet the needs of their workloads. In addition to what AWS services offer, 
AWS technology partners integrate their existing on-prem solutions to use the AWS services and add capabilities to protect and manage on-prem and cloud-based workloads. Lastly, there is the consulting partners that understand AWS services and technology solutions from partners and combine these to help customers meet their business needs. Uh, for example, in specific domains such as education or the health sector. So in terms of AWS storage services, uh, specifically, AWS has a wide variety of services, and here is just a representation of the various categories, including file, block, and object, and key services under those categories. Uh, so under the file services category, we have Amazon EFS and Amazon FSx. Under block, we have uh, Amazon EBS, that is a network attached block storage and Amazon EC2 instance store, that is temporary local storage available with specific instance families. For backup solutions, some of the most popular storage services are the object services like Amazon Simple Storage Service or S3, and the various storage classes under those such as S3 Glacier and a recently released Glacier Deep Archive service. In addition to the storage services, AWS also offers a wide variety of uh, data transfer services that help customers move large amounts of data in AWS uh, to AWS in an efficient and cost-effective manner. This category of services includes AWS Direct Connect that gives customers a de dedicated bandwidth from their data centers to AWS, and the services like AWS Snowball that give customers the option of moving their data out of band by passing their network on ruggedized storage devices that AWS ships to their data centers, and then customers can copy the data and send it over to us at AWS where we, where we copy the data into uh, Amazon S3. In terms of uh, Amazon S3 storage classes, uh, these are categorized based on the frequency of access, starting from storing the most active data on uh, standard S3 and are fairly recently released in or maximum durability and resiliency. So if you compare this to on-premise world, from a backup and recovery perspective, what we offer is the equivalent uh, of creating three separate copies. On the archive side, we have S3 Glacier for storing data that needs to be stored for long-term and does not need to be accessed frequently. If accessed, the application should be able to accept a delay of a couple of hours for that data to be available. And we introduced the Glacier Deep Archive early this year that is designed for data that is even colder and access times of anywhere from 12 to 48 hours are acceptable. This class is perfect for use cases where customers would use a tape-based solution in the on-premise world. From a pricing perspective, this class is the most economical of all storage classes that we offer today with pricing of around a dollar a terabyte a month and you get three copies at that price. So let's look at what customers generally see as backup and restore uh, challenges from an on-premise backup point of view. First is the underlying infrastructure difficult to manage. You have to think in terms of servers, virtualization platforms, storage protocols, uh, various storage vendors and peculiarity of each and every vendor. So there are a lot of manual aspects of managing the infrastructure. And if you look at scaling the storage solutions, especially when customers need to add disk or tape capacity or even compute capacity, that is extremely difficult and time consuming. It is also very costly. Uh, On-premise systems usually eat into capital expenses in addition to yearly maintenance costs and hardware and software upgrade costs, training costs, and so on. In addition, we see more and more customers that need to meet compliance re uh, regulations that get tied to long-term data storage. For example, GDPR, HIPAA and healthcare, and others that are harder to achieve with uh, traditional backup and recovery solutions. 
So what are some of the benefits that AWS offers from a backup and recovery solution perspective? For one, it is an integrated solution. You have various storage classes available as different services under one roof. It is also a highly secure environment with multiple options available from AWS and AWS partners for encrypting data at rest and in motion, for tighter access controls and various other security solutions. It's very easy to maintain compared to on-premise storage solutions. Interface is simple, globally available over the internet. Customers can just go to the AWS console and create a bucket in the region of choice and start using that. Uh, there is no need to know the details behind how the data is stored and things like that, which is all managed behind the scenes by us. And it needs no maintenance or frequent hardware and software upgrades. It can automatically scale up in terms of capacity and performance uh, based on your business needs. Uh, for example, Amazon S3 offers virtually unlimited capacity. So if your data grows, Amazon S3 scales automatically and there is nothing that the customer needs to do. And finally, it has an OPEX model where you only pay for what you use. Uh, there are no upfront costs, no yearly maintenance costs, no upgrade costs and so on. You do not have to pre-purchase storage in anticipation that it will be used. You only use what you need and you pay only for that. So AWS storage competency partners like Rubrik uh, bring the following benefits to the table. Ease of configuration. Protection of on-premise and cloud workloads is very simple to configure. You have the options like policy-based backups, incremental file and block level backups available to meet your data protection use cases and needs. You can create multiple copies of data and use various AWS storage classes that we covered from Amazon S3 for short-term backups to Glacier Deep Archive for your long-term retention use cases. You can recover data rapidly, be it doing granular recoveries where you can restore individual objects or you can restore multiple machines, either back to on-prem environments or in AWS. And then these solutions make data management cost effective by using storage optimization technologies such as data compression, uh, global deduplication and others. So as I mentioned earlier that AWS offers a highly secure environment where we support the multiple security and encryption options to ensure security of your data. So in addition to that, uh, for customers to meet their compliance needs, we have various certifications and assurance programs that we work with. And the key ones are highlighted here in the slide. We have over 200 compliance, uh, governance and security certifications. Some prominent examples you will see here are ISO 27017, that is a standard for security controls for cloud services. Uh, ISO 27018, that deals with cloud privacy, uh, certifications like SOC 1, SOC 2, and SOC 3. Uh, customers could be HIPAA and PCI compliant, as well as GDR compliant, GDPR compliant on AWS platform. Uh, want to briefly touch upon our shared security model that we provide in the AWS cloud, where AWS is responsible for managing and controlling the components from host operating systems and virtualization layer down to the physical security of the data centers in which the services operate. And our customers are responsible for building secure applications. To help our customers build secure applications, we provide a wide variety of best practice documents, tools and programs like the well-architected program, where we provide guidance to our customers on building best in class secure solutions on AWS. And the best thing about the cloud is that all AWS customers gain the benefits in terms of AWS policies, architecture and operational processes that are designed to meet the needs of the most security conscious customers so that our customers can fully focus on driving and growing their business. And now I would like to introduce uh, Pierre Francois, who is a technical manager partner solutions at Rubrik to walk us through the Rubrik cloud data management solution. Thank you, Girish. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone. So um, why Rubrik and, and what is it? Uh, so the first observation that we made when we started is that in terms of data protection, uh, the solutions that were out in the market were too much complicated with uh, uh, multiple different components such as 
you know, the backup proxies to retrieve the data or to ingest the data and the repositories to store it. And then the, uh, the, the identification catalog, uh, because actually you need to make, to do something to reduce the search footprint to, to take down costs and the backup software and, and maybe uh, you would do some tape out. And so everything was requiring some, some specific or dedicated servers that you would need to uh, deploy, maintain, update, uh, make sure that they are highly available or redundant, which is not always the case. So it was really complicated to deploy and to manage uh, all of this. So our first idea was to simplify all of that. So to simplify the architecture first and then how you would manage that. So to do this, what we do is that we took all of these different components that again, were used to be uh, installed or deployed onto uh, multiple different servers and put all of these roles in one single software fabric. Um, so with that, when you deploy the, the different nodes or appliances, um, you have everything in one single box. And when I'm saying box, it, it's not necessarily physical. Um, and that means that it's a masterless architecture and you don't need to worry about uh, what if my proxy fails or what if my backup server fails or what if my catalog fails, you know, all nodes have the exact same rules. So it's extremely easy to install. We have a process that is called uh, bootstrap um, that takes approximately 30 minutes. And as you grow and as you need to back up more data, you just have to add nodes in the same cluster that is sharing the same global namespace where everything is distributed. With that, you can very easily interact with the cloud and AWS in particular, and we'll see how and why, as well as you can automate pretty much everything since uh, the solution is um, or has an API first architecture, uh, which means that you have API endpoints to automate everything and you can pretty much integrate with you know, any solution on the market to do some configuration management or deployment or different things like that and some specific features for security, but I'll touch on that on the next slide. And so when you start with rubric and the cluster is deployed, the first thing that you have to do is discover the environment. If we think about virtual environments, for example, on premises, it's extremely easy. You just have to add your uh, virtual environment management server to the rubric environment, and then everything will be discovered automatically. You don't need to like, add virtual machines manually one by one so that we can back them up. You don't have to do that. And as you can see on that slide, we actually support multiple different platforms and non only virtual environments. So of course we support multiple hypervisors, but also physical machines, multiple um, operating systems such as Windows, Linux, AIX, Solaris, applications, databases, NoSQL databases as well, uh, whether they are physical or virtual again. Um, we also have a policy driven approach, which means that uh, instead of having to deal with jobs that you would need to create, configure and schedule and deal with the scheduling, which tends to be quite complicated. Uh, you just have to think about the actual needs of your workloads or applications. So these needs in terms of data protections are uh, how often do you need to back up to back them up? So that would be to uh, meet the, the RPOs or recovery point objectives. Um, what retention do you need locally on premises so that you can do fast restores? What longer term retention do you need? Maybe on cheaper storage. Uh, and do you need replication for disaster recovery purposes? And as soon as you know that, you just create your policies and attach these policies to anything that you need to, to back up, whether it's virtual, physical applications, files, NAS, anything. Um, we'll talk about uh, the interaction with the cloud a little more, but in these policies, you have the archival that is um, completely built in. So you don't have to configure anything separate 
uh, to be able to send your data, your backup data to AWS. Of course, backing up is kind of mandatory, but what is backup if you cannot restore and above all, if you cannot restore fast. And so for that, we have uh, some instant recovery or live mount capabilities that will help you uh, put back into production virtual machines or SQL or Oracle databases uh, almost instantaneously directly from the, the rubric uh, system. And in terms of security, uh, we have an end-to-end -end encryption. So that means that whenever we transport data, so when data is in flight or when it's at rest, everything is encrypted. That's the first thing. And the second thing is that we have uh, different things to fight ransomware. The first one is that when backup data is stored on the rubric cluster, uh, it's actually immutable. The way that we manage the backup storage is that when, once the backup is written on the, on the storage, uh, it is snapshotted, which is how we uh, manage versioning and, and retention. But when you have that snapshot, the actual data is in the read-only mode. So that means it, can, it cannot be changed, modified, or encrypted, for instance. And then we have something that we call Polaris Radar that helps detecting ransomware attacks, give visibility over what has been impacted, and that allows you to uh, recover in one click all the data that has been encrypted in case of a ransomware attack, for example. So in terms of interaction with the cloud, um, the first thing, or maybe the, the easiest to start with, is to leverage cloud storage uh, to do some archival. And again, this is built in our policies that we call SLA mains. Uh, and we'll actually uh, dig a little bit deeper in that right after. The second use case is once you have uh, data, backup data that is sent and stored in AWS, uh, we can actually use that data to instantiate workloads directly as native EC2 instances. So we can, we can convert, if you will, uh, virtual machines that you backed up on premises that you send to AWS to EC2 instances so that you can run your applications and, and workloads directly in AWS. But then once you have workloads in AWS, you may want to protect them. And we can do that as well uh, in two ways. And I'll, I'll touch on that as well. But first, let's dig a little bit deeper uh, in the archival piece. So in terms of feature, this is called Cloud Out. And again, it's built in our SLA domain, so our uh, policies. So you just have to configure your AWS storage account, whether it's F3, F3 infrequent access or uh, Glacier uh, in, the, in the rubric software. And then in the policy, you would just choose that storage account uh, as the archival location. And once you have done that and attached the policy to any object that you need to back, to back up, then it will be automat automatically sent to the corresponding um, storage account in AWS automatically. And, and of course, according to the settings that you would have set, such as the retention that you set. Um, let's talk a little bit uh, more about that feature, because actually we're talking about sending backup data to the cloud, basically, to AWS. Uh, but, you know, most customers will want to know what exactly it's going to involve in terms of cost, uh, because actually you're sending backup data. So how do you do it? Um, how do you deal with incrementals and fulls and things like that? And what happens when you need to restore something from the cloud? So important things to note here is that Rubrik uses a forever incremental backup approach which means that once the first full backup has been done and sent, you only need to send the, uh, the subsequent incremental backups. So we only send new data to uh, AWS. That's the first thing. The second thing is that before sending anything to AWS, we first optimize the storage footprint on premises. 
So how do we do that? We actually apply some deduplication and compression. And so data is sent compressed and deduplicated to uh, AWS. Now, of course, when you need to recover something, it's important to understand how it works because you, you will be interested in uh, knowing that egress charges will be reduced or optimized as well. So the first thing is if you need to recover files, for example, everything is indexed. And since we index everything, it's very easy for customers and users to use our global instant search engine uh, to identify the files that you need to restore. And from there, when you select the file that you need to restore, when it's restored from the cloud, we actually only retrieve the required blocks that correspond to that specific file that you need to restore. So we do not download, for instance, an entire backup or a snapshot to be able to, re to restore a single file. We will only uh, retrieve the, the required blocks. So that's very important. And the last thing about archival is for NAS data. If you think about backing up very large NAS systems, um, it can be a problem uh, in terms of storage that it will take uh, on, on the backup system. Uh, so on the rubric in that case. Uh, because actually, if you have like billions of files and, and, and petabytes of data, you will still have to store the full somewhere. So to address that specifically, we have something that is called NAS Direct Archive. And what this feature will do is that we will still retrieve and ingest the data through rubric. We will index everything as always. So you can have that you know, global um, Google Live Search Engine. So you can do um, easy, fast, uh, granular restores of files. Uh, but then what we'll do in terms of storing that data is that we will pass it through directly to the archival location. So if you set uh, a policy that says this data when backed up will be archived to Amazon S3, then rubric will ingest it, index it, but send it directly to S3 without storing any of the actual data on the rubric cluster. The only thing that we will store is the, the metadata for searches, that's it. So by doing this, you leverage the, the, uh, the advantages of the, of the cloud and cloud storage in that case, but while still having the advantages and benefits of rubric uh, policies and indexing capabilities. So once you have backup data in the cloud, uh, as I was saying before, you can actually instantiate uh, some of this data as native EC2 instances. So we do cloud conversion, if you will. Um, that feature is called CloudOn. And you can absolutely do that on demand when you need to maybe test something specific in the cloud. You don't want to uh, use local resources. So you can absolutely convert on demand a specific workload to an EC2 instance and do whatever test and development that you need. Or you can do that incrementally and in an automated manner. So you can absolutely um, have policies that will say, as soon as I have an incremental backup that is sent to S3, I want it to be converted to an EC2 instance so I can regularly do my tests or my development or, again, whatever you might need to do with that specific machine. And last but not least, once you have these EC2 instances running in AWS, you may want to back them up. And the good, the good thing or the good news is that actually you have two ways of doing that. Uh, for let's say, um, I was going to say regular or standard version machines, uh, we have uh, a native, EC2 backup capability that will actually leverage EBS snapshotting capability. So we will actually orchestrate and automate the workflow of triggering an EBS snapshot to use that as the baseline for backup. Um, and if you're running some very specific workloads in these EC2 instances, such as SQL databases or Oracle databases, and, and you need to have some 
you know, very short and granular um, RPOs, uh, you may want to be able to back up not only the databases and, and the data inside these databases, but also the transaction or archive logs to enable these um, short RPOs. And in that case, what you can do is that you can absolutely deploy our software, Rubric Cloud Data Management, or CDM, uh, in the form of a virtual cluster in AWS. It's exactly the same software as you would have on-premises. And with that, you can absolutely leverage our SQL and Oracle integration to reach uh, these objective of, of you know, very short RPOs. And with that, I have the pleasure to hand the presentation over to Tony. Thank you very much, Pierre. Greetings, everyone. I'm Tony Carrero. I'm the Enterprise Systems Manager at the University of the Pacific. Uh, I manage a team of systems administrators as well as application administrators. We're responsible for servers, storage, AWS backups, and several production applications for the university. Just a quick uh, overview of the University of the Pacific. We're based in Northern California. We have campuses located in Sacramento, San Francisco, and Stockton, which is our primary campus. Uh, we offer more than 80 undergraduate and 30 graduate programs serving over 6,000 students. And we pride ourselves in being a vibrant learning environment with small class sizes, student faculty ratio of 13 to one. Just a brief overview of our environment. Uh, we are a cloud first institution. Um, what that basically means is when selecting technologies uh, for our needs and processes, uh, we look to hosting providers and cloud options first and typically go with what makes sense for the given use cases. Um, this factors in functionality, usability, cost, and ROI. Uh, we have three data centers uh, across three campuses, approximately 600 servers. Over 90% of them are virtualized in VMware as well as EC2 and Amazon. Uh, we're running mostly Windows and Linux workloads of the Red Hat variety. And we're currently using AWS for public DNS and Route 53, our primary websites and our content management. Um, some authentication portal services, academic applications for our, LM, our primary LMS, um, as well as replication of some of our internal core services, DNS, Active Directory, et cetera. Um, our internet consists uh, uh, primarily of, it's pretty large, five gig, um, and I'll explain why that's useful um, in subsequent slides. Most of the backups we perform are on VMware or EBS snapshot based. Some, we have some client backups and then a couple of direct database backups, as well as some file dumps. Um, we mainly leverage rubric backup service for file system consistency over crash consistency. And backups are nightly with a 90-day snapshot retention, and we typically will cache anywhere from 14 to 30 days on premise. So some of the backup and restore challenges we had prior to Rubrik and AWS, um, we had an ex expensive and aging legacy backup solution. Our previous solution was incredibly complex and difficult to manage uh, across disparate systems. You essentially needed a bachelor's degree in software to, or in order to administer it. We had several different policies to manage on different schedules. We were following the traditional full differential backup methodology. Um, the hardware reached the point where it couldn't be upgraded, which gated us from many new features as well as leveraging the cloud. The renewals were getting pricier, um, as expected. Uh, new purchase was going to be exceedingly expensive due to our licensing. Um, and then MUR, obviously, is always a challenge for us um, in our, uh, when we're purchasing on-premise equipment. A lot of our backups are decentralized, as I mentioned, over disparate systems. Um, we had backups defined all over the place, as well as multiple versions of backup software for specific use cases. One for each campus, one for exchange, et cetera. Um, each is an independent system to maintain. Unstructured data based on file system snapshot and replication, uh, which wasn't even using the backup system. Um, we had some snapshot defined backups and site replication. Um, 
We had several backup storage capacity issues. Uh, we'd reached the maximum number of shelves we could have on every appliance, and we're continually running into those issues. Um, we suspected this had a lot to do with the way we were backing things up, but the technology was not conducive to providing consistent data on this. Uh, and then, of course, the inability to archive to the cloud. Part of being a, a cloud first um, meant that we really wanted to be able to burst into the cloud on demand so that we, we can offset storage capacity issues when needed. Um, this for longevity, it was impossible to do with our prior backup system. We were also relying on site-to-site -site replication for archival, which was problematic being as not all sites were geographically redundant. Both storage and archival created a challenge for us, providing the proper tools for universal uh, for a universal data retention policy for the university. Some additional challenges, uh, like very lengthy time to recover. It used to take us hours, if not days, to restore a simple VM. Even VMs that failed to boot after patching um, that were only about 60 gigs in size. Larger VMs would take even longer, as I mentioned. Um, more complex backup workloads proved cumbersome and could take several days. Um, we didn't have any advanced security features. While our backups were offline in nature, there was growing concern about the data exposure in the event of like an account compromise on the appliances or, or uh, various disparate systems. Also, none of the appliances were capable of encrypting data at rest, which is a pretty big deal for us. Um, so there were some concerns over compliance requirements. And it was virtually impossible to report on any data from backups for security analysts in a uniform manner. Uh, we do have some reporting, but it was not uniform across the board. Um, we required daily manual monitoring and management. We um, had a limited set of reports, but it was very difficult to figure out what was backed up and where. Some, some new systems were also not being added to backups, which created a risk in trying to maintain data integrity. Much of our internal notification addition processes were manual and prone to error. Automated notifications were very limited. So we had to have an operator basically continually watching the backups from the consoles every night and weekend to ensure that the backups succeeded consistently and basically report on, um, on those that have errors. And then, of course, we had limited staff for support. It's pretty common in higher ed. Um, I was worried that our backup admin would basically never take a vacation because the rest of the team wouldn't know how to restore in case something happened, et cetera. Um, it was basically a single point of failure. To address these challenges, we basically graduated to the cloud with Rubrik and AWS, that's what I'm calling it. Um, so, Darren mentioned a single software fabric for complete data management with the Rubrik platform, and that's basically what we accomplished with the CDM. Um, all backups are now centralized via Rubrik CDM, as well as Polaris. Uh, no disparate backup systems or site-to-site -site re replication, et cetera. Uh, instead of policy management, we're now utilizing the simplified rubric SLAs, which are the, basically the backup and archive schedule, snapshot retention for on-premise and AWS snapshots. Um, central visibility into VMware and AWS EC2 for backup assignment and status. And then ease of use, um, anyone on my team can now pick up the rubric CDM in a matter of minutes and enable and disable backups, recover, check status, et cetera. And then with Rubrik, we now have a single pane of glass to centrally control backups. Um, this provided uh, some benefits, um, obviously full visibility in, of the backup environment and SLAs, events and alerting upon backups uh, and system failures, automating backups of new systems, uh, and then we can disable backups globally if needed. That's pretty handy for uh, patching especially. Um, and then restores now take minutes uh, with rubric live mounting. This is actually one of my very favorite features. Um, we've had several successes uh, with this met method of recovery, even when pulling down backups older than 14 days from S3. Uh, the technology is, is pretty phenomenal. Um, you basically select the VM to recover, choose live mount, select the hypervisor you want to mount it to, and then rubric will automatically create the necessary data store and connections to mount and power on the VM directly to the appliance. We found in some cases that the, perform the performance of such mounts can actually be faster than VMs running on our hybrid arrays. Um, this has dramatically reduced our overall RTO capabilities across the board. And then um, 
as mentioned previously, we were replicating to a secondary site for long-term data retention, but rather than buying a second or third or fourth matching appliance to do this, um, we were able to utilize Rubrics Cloud Out, as Pierre mentioned, and S3 for all our archival. We are now caching backups on premise anywhere from 14 to 30 days. And then we basically just keep, a, we, use, we leverage their instant archive to keep the rest up to S3 for 90 days. Um, and then with um, the, the uh, instant archive basically allows a duplicate full backup with all the change blocks in both locations, pretty nice. Um, and then with NAS Direct, we're able to take a lot of our unstructured data, which doesn't change very often and put that directly into S3 without eating up any capacity on premise. Um, it, it's about a 10% um, footprint on the appliance, but it, it's still pretty nice uh, when you're talking about terabytes of data. Um, and then both CloudOut and NAS Direct provide some nice options to keep the on-premise utilization down, as I mentioned, um, you know, leveraging the cloud relatively inexpensively. And then also, so uh, the Rubrik AWS hybrid approach is scalable, scalable in nature, as you might imagine. Um, Rubrik's hardware design is a simple four node appliance um, or more um, that can be expanded or reduced as needed. Um, we all, we're also leveraging a set of virtual appliances. They call them the Rubrik Edge uh, for our branch offices and offloading needs. Um, and then with Instant Archive, as I mentioned, dedupe and compression carries over to S3 seamlessly while retaining a full copy. We found that even with the initial purchase, we have more than enough capacity um, thanks to the advanced dedupe compression. Um, and basically complete visibility over snapshot ballooning. That's pretty handy when you're backing up like the, um, any sort of database servers that have like flat file dumps and stuff like that because it's very inefficient for uh, dedupe. Uh, Rubrik offers a very simplified, uh, very simplified licensing options with their physical and virtual appliances and the costs are all upfront. Uh, this was a huge benefit to us um, that we were coming from a technology that basically had perpetual licensing, several add-ons to keep track of, um, and it wasn't—it it really wasn't easy to track and update and renewals. Um, and in AWS, of course, we're leveraging the flexible on-demand pricing model uh, for S3 and EC2, which is very straightforward. I mean, you have several options there to keep the cost down. Um, and um, we've also been able to keep the cost down in S3 by archiving directly to standard and frequent access as we found our backup archival doesn't change very often. Um, and then we're also uh, cloud converting e uh, VMs to EC2 instances with the click of a button. Uh, CloudOn is an incredible technology that we've been recently leveraging uh, quite a bit. Um, it's intended to be a cold standby of AMIs or, or uh, in AWS for DR. But we've actually found it most beneficial recently for migrating development and production workloads to AWS. Basically, with the click of a button, we can enable it for any given VM and VMware, and it'll convert it and stage the VM uh, as an AMI template in, the Am in Amazon in the background. Um, this uses all the native tools in AWS on the back end, and we found it to be foolproof in copying VMs uh, to native EC2. And then last but not least, um, encryption at rest and immutability to, to ransomware by design. Uh, with Rubrik, we have the peace of mind that all our backups are encrypted at rest. Um, we also enabled encryption in S3 for all archival utilizing Amazon KMS. And the setup has been very straightforward. All S3 buckets are locked down by default and the Rubrik appliances won't present any data uh, or amounts to the environment that's not specifically associated with the restore process. That's fantastic for compliance reasons and whatnot. So some recent successes we've had, um, we're, we're pretty proud of these. Um, we, uh, for instant server and data recoveries, again, one of my favorite features, we basically converted uh, SharePoint SQL backups to native SQL uh, with the rubric backup service. This allowed us to provide a recovery of a couple of key SharePoint files, as well as an entire site collection in minutes using live mount of the database in the SharePoint dev environment. My SharePoint admin actually loves this feature. Um, this has also allowed us to cut down on snapshot ballooning, as I mentioned prior, um, that was taking place with the traditional SQL file extracts, we've, which we've also started using um, on back up, backing up other SQL implementations. Um, in one case, we were able to instantly recover a critical server that provides connectivity between our document management and ERP systems. 
And then in another case, we were able to temporarily revert a VM to pull up a report for a KPI because the logs have been truncated too early uh, before the analyst could provide the data. It was on a Friday. And then uh, we've also been able to more confidently manage patch, uh, patching in Windows, um, given that the immediate we can immediately recover any server that fails to boot um, after patching. And yes, it still happens. We actually just had one about two weeks ago. Um, server recoveries have also been commonplace for testing with live mounts. So uh, all site-to-site -site replication also um, has been consolidated into a simple archival from on-premise to AWS S3, regardless of where the rubric appliance lives and regardless of whether it's hardware or virtual. With the high durability of S3, we do have peace of mind that we can re retain the integrity of our daily backups and retain those backups to a potentially indefinite period of time. We also test this uh, pretty regularly as well, uh, downloading snapshots from the cloud and that sort of thing. Um, and then my, uh, another success, uh, migrating all of our, our main primary production website to AWS. Um, this was a huge win for us. Basically with Rubrik Cloud on, uh, simplifying the VM conversion process with VM import um, and uh, being able to convert it to AWS AMI. And the fact that our snapshot ar archival is already residing in S3, we were basically able to successfully create a uh, complete duplicate clone of our production website environment for testing purposes. This allowed us to upgrade our CMS, um, do some um, new things with our, with our IIS nodes, et cetera. Um, as well as plan for uh, a complete migration. And then ultimately, we migrated all of Pacific EDU uh, to AWS and leveraged all the availability and durabilities of that platform. Um, our next step being scalability um, in, on, in future upgrades. And then last but not least, uh, we migrated some authentication portals to AWS. Um, Again, Rubrik and AWS allowed us to seamlessly lift and shift uh, a lot of these servers, um, and then AWS provided us tools to make our core services uh, completely redundant should the VPN tunnel go, uh, to on-premise go offline. So just in summary, a lot of the benefits, um, you know, we've reduced our RTOs uh, by over 90% from hours down to minutes, uh, thanks to live mounting, and et cetera. Um, save more than 95% daily management time. Um, you know, we can rapidly convert virtual machines to Amazon EC2 instances using the staging methodology with CloudOn. Um, and we have a, a plethora of options for backup recovery and data retention. Um, we're, we're basically providing a lot of tools for the university, um, you know, as we start building a lot of these policies and whatnot both from op an operational as well as a security standpoint. Uh, obviously, more secure data management. Uh, I can't stress that enough. You know, that's, that's top of our mind um, uh, from the university leadership on down. Um, and then, uh, again, last but not least, you know, we streamlined all our reporting of backups. You know, Polaris provides a really nice platform for, for me to provide a KPI every week. Uh, we have full visibility of our backup environment. It's incredibly useful. And with that, I will hand it back over to Garish. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tony, for that insightful story. Now, at this point, we would like to open the floor for questions. Please uh, note that you can submit your questions in the questions panel. And looks like we have a few questions. So the first one for you, Tony. Uh, so are you utilizing uh, a glacier in any way? or are there any future plans to do so? So um, that, that's a good question. Um, we had looked at doing that initially, um, but unfortunately with Glacier, um, uh, our main backup methodology um, needs to be continual in nature and, and the way Glacier's API does vaulting and whatnot, um, it's really handy for like long-term data retention or infrequent backups where you do it like once a month or once a quarter, that sort of thing but we haven't incorporated that methodology into our backup paradigm yet. Um, but we are looking into that. And then it's my understanding, you know, it, it, AWS is moving to kind of a unified platform. I'm sure Garish could probably speak more to that, but um, where 
it seems like S3, you know, the life cycle policies are moving towards that direction. Um, so we're hoping to use those down the road as those features become available. Um, and uh, um, and then obviously, you know, as as the university builds a better data, uh, you know, builds a uh, standardized data retention policy, you know, we're, we're probably going to want to leverage the vaulting a, a bit more for the long term data retention. So hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, thank you, Tony. Just to just to add on to that, uh, definitely, right? From from an AWS perspective, uh, you know, you would want to use Glacier or uh, Glacier Deep Archive for your long-term retention uh, use cases, where data needs to be retained for you know uh, typically multiple years, and uh, Rubrik does support uh, Glacier today, and uh, Deep Archive uh, Glacier Deep Archive is on the roadmap. So moving on to the next question here. Uh, this one is for Pierre. And uh, the question is, does Rubrik Cloud uh, need any Rubrik installation in AWS uh, Cloud or on-prem can take care of it? OK, so depending on what needs to be backed up, uh, like I said, um, we can do some native EC2 protection. Uh, in that case, there are two solutions currently. You can do you can do it with uh, an on-premises cluster, uh, or you can do it with Polaris that Tony mentioned, which is our SaaS platform. And Polaris offers native EC2 backup as, backup as well. Um, and and actually going forward, uh, Polaris will be the go-to platform for uh, this kind of of native uh, cloud backup. Um, and if you need to back up something more specific, such, such as SQL or or Oracle, and you need to to do what basically Tony described for their uh, databases, um, and, and and do some native SQL or Oracle uh, backup, then you would need to deploy what we call the Rubrik Cloud Edition uh, in AWS, which is basically CDM, so our software cloud data management. Um, in the form of a virtual cluster, it comes by default with four nodes, uh, and you deploy that. It's it's the exact same software with the same features and the same UI, and from there you can deploy our Rubrik backup service within these EC2 instances to do some SQL or Oracle backup to the um, uh, Rubrik Cloud Edition that is running uh, on AWS. So two two different scenarios here. Thank you, Pierre. Uh, there is another question uh, for you, Pierre, as well. So mm -hmm. in addition to SQL, uh, do you, does Rubrik support uh, uh, HANA and DB2 uh, databases? Right. So yes, we do support SAP HANA, and we have a specific integration with uh, SAP HANA. That's a very good point and question. Uh, as per DB2, uh, we don't have like a native integration such as with uh, what we have with Oracle SQL or uh, SAP HANA for instance but since we are able to leverage pre backup and post backup scripts we can actually leverage that to you know perform the right actions prior to running the backup and then which which would be basically you know like pausing the, the backup or freezing the IOs or whatever the method might be with with DB2 and then do the reverse after the backup so that you, you have an automated workflow um, within the, the, the backup policy. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, another question is, are you using AWS Storage Gateway with the Rubrik appliance? And if so, which type? Uh, so Rubrik, Rubrik has built-in support for uh, talking directly to AWS. So, That's right. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so I, I guess that um, gateways such as like the, the, the VTL gateway and things like that, maybe. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So no, because as you were saying, uh, we have that native support of S3 and S3 and frequent access and Glacier. So we do not need to use such gateways to send data to AWS. Uh, it, it's really built in uh, the software. 
Perfect. Thank you, Pierre. Uh, another question is, uh, can you protect physical servers in addition to the virtual servers? Yes, we can. Um, we, like we said, and, and, and Tony said as well, we do support multiple hypervisors, so virtual environments, but also physical servers. So for that, we support multiple uh, operating systems from Windows to Linux to uh, AIX and Solaris and, and, and things like that. So that, yeah, quite a lot of different platforms, actually. Perfect. Uh, another question is, uh, what kind of encryption do you use? Mm -hmm. So, um, in terms of encryption, we do end-to-end -end encryption. So, we encrypt data in flight, so when it's transiting, or uh, at rest. And so, depending on where, what we're talking about, we use different algorithms. Like, for example, um, for backing up VMware virtual machines, we use the NBD SSL protocol. And so as the name implies, in that case, we use SSL to encrypt the data in flight. Uh, at rest on the rubric cluster, we use AES-256. Um, and for anything that is not VMware on-premises to ingest the data, we use TLS 1.2. Uh, and for storing the data, for instance, in, in AWS, so at rest again, we also use AES-256. Uh, and for the um, for the the key encryption key, <laughs> we we can use either AES two fifty six or RSA twenty forty eight. Perfect. Thank you, Pierre. Uh, and uh, one more question here is: uh, What is the best way to engage with the rubric and AWS? Uh, if, right. Yeah, if you can, yeah. Go ahead. Yes, yeah, so, so on the rubric side of things, um, if you know your local account team, you can absolutely reach out to them. And, and actually, I think that's that would probably be the best way to engage with rubric. Um, if not, do not hesitate to send an email to info at rubric.com and we'll make sure that the right persons uh, come back to you. Thank you, Pierre. Yeah, on the AWS side, I mean, it's, uh, you know, the, in terms of integration, you know, basically all you need is an AWS account. Once you have the AWS account, basically you just plug in those details uh, into rubric when you're creating your uh, policies. Uh, you know, for example, when you're creating your uh, cloud archive policy, once we have that, then rubric will automatically start uh, using these services in that AWS account. So it's a very straightforward process there. All right. Uh, that's all we had for questions. And uh, now I wanna leave you with a couple of uh, links that you can use to learn more about our products. Uh, you can use the first link to learn about AWS, uh, the storage, specifically the storage products. And the second one uh, basically, you know, uh, helps you uh, learn more about rubric solutions for AWS. And uh, if you already haven't, you can go to the uh, third link, which is aws.amazon.com slash free to sign up for a free trial of AWS services. Uh, you can register for an account at this link. And uh, essentially what, what happens is you get to try out certain AWS services for free uh, for a period of 12 months. Uh, with that, I would like to thank you all for attending today's webinar. Uh, please remember to uh, stay connected and complete the brief survey at the conclusion of this webinar. We look forward to supporting you in your current and future projects. Uh, thank you again and have a great day.